Hymn Book, it's hymn number 406, my favorite. Solid Rock. My favorite. It's my favorite. We know. We said that. It's my favorite. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' love and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend. Concerning the uh, Operation Christmas Child uh, and all the work they're going to be doing this year, and uh, it is—it's uh, not a fundraiser. It doesn't cost you anything. If you are bringing some children that need child care, we actually bring two dollars per child. That's pretty cheap child care, uh, but it's good child care. And uh, so, uh, actually, come bring them, and uh, we're going to have a great time uh, eating together, fellowship, and hearing about what we've got planned for this year. So, great things going on that way. And then, don't forget. Uh, February the 14th is a Sunday. That evening, Sunday evening, we won't have an evening service because we're going to have a Valentine banquet. And uh, uh, I'm going to be like big time preacher. I'm going to charge you to come that night. <laughs> but not to hear me preach, to eat. We're going to have a great time of eating and banqueting together. 
and a lot of fun, and that is a fundraiser. That will be to raise funds for Operation Christmas Child. So uh, that's February the 14th. Don't forget that. You need to buy tickets, $10 per person. Uh, see Jasmine. Uh, she'll be here for some school. See Jasmine. <coughs> she'll be glad to get you hooked up with a ticket uh, on uh, December the 10th. December the 10th. I'm sorry. I saw someone walk by that threw me off. <laughs> <laughs> those windows will be gone in a couple of months, and uh, you won't be able to see out those anymore. Those will be gone because outside there can be a nice good foyer area. Yes. <sighs> All right, no, February 14th. February 14th, that's what I meant to say. Council meeting this Tuesday. If you're on council, you'll get a call from me on Tuesday reminding you. Make sure you come and be a part of our council. This is our first council of the year, and we love to have all of our council like that 100% for our first meeting for sure, so try to be there for that. All right, I think that's it. The, the kids will be fed Thursday night. The kids will be fed Thursday night. Okay, the kids, somebody told me to ask about Thursday night fish, right? The kids will be fed Thursday night fish, or they got some I'll say pizza. Pizza, if they, uh, yeah, okay, good. So they will be fed for that $2, so they're pretty good. All right, now, brother, come and send us home. Let's stand together and sing. In the garden, it's hymn number 187.
Amen. Amen. Right? Amen. 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 Come on. Stay with me now. Amen. Amen. Glory. Amen. 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 You know, that hurt real bad. It's people say amen, hallelujah, more swallow. Amen. Hallelujah. Word. 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 I'm excited about this morning. I'm excited because we're moving into the new section of Romans. We are moving out of the doctrinal section into a very practical section. You know that about Paul's writing. Anytime any of Paul's epistles are divided, they have a they have a start out, they start out with a doctrinal section, and then someplace in there, usually midway, they'll change to a very practical, putting what you've learned in doctrine into a practical account. Uh, in Romans, he waited until chapter 12 to get started. That's okay. He's going to load us up between 12 and 16, and we're going to see that in just a moment. Uh, our text this morning is Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. So if you will, you have your Bible open, follow along with me as I read. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you for this morning. I pray that in the next few minutes, you'll allow us, Father, just to step into glory, step into your presence, stand around your throne, and hear from you this morning, Father. Uh, we don't want to hear from men. We've, we've seen what men can produce this week, and it's nothing that we want to be a part of. We want what you have for us, God. And so we ask, Father, in the next few minutes that you'll take control of this service and this pastor and our ears so that we might hear what you want us to hear, so that we might respond the way you want us to respond. We sure love you. We thank you, God, for the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. As I said, we start today on the practical side of the teaching of Paul. He's finished that doctrinal section. The doctrine has included, not, not exclusively, but has included the doctrine of sin, the wrath of God, selection, election, salvation, grace, work of the Holy Spirit, and the sovereignty of God, among other things. But now we move to chapters 12 through 16, which is a tutorial on Christian living based on the doctrines that we've learned in the first 11 chapters. So let's see how he begins this particular section. He said, I beseech you therefore. Now, if you've not been to church long, you may not have heard this, but those of you that's been here, you understand this. When you see the word therefore, what does that tell you? Based on everything else before this, everything I've taught you, or therefore, every, uh, what I'm talking, based on what I've just taught you, I beseech you, that's a strong admonition. He's saying a strong admonition based on what I've already taught you. I'm urging you to listen. I'm urging you to take it and put it into practice. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Living sacrifice. First, let's consider the motivation. What is the motivation for us giving our lives, sacrificing our lives as a living sacrifice? What is the motivation? Well, it's, he says it's the mercies of God. The mercies of God. God's mercy toward me deserved a response of sacrifice. What God did for me deserves that I respond with sacrifice of my life. Now, God's mercy to save me, God's mercy to forgive me, God's mercy to adopt me, God's mercy to fill me, God's mercy to change me, God's mercy to love me. My goodness, that's a bunch of mercies, amen? Amen, yes. I mean, and I haven't even named them all. That's right. By these mercies, we should be willing to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to God. That's our motivation. Now, our responsibility then is to sacrifice. Now, here's the problem that I find with this living sacrifice. If you learn the word, it's, a, it's, kind, of a, it's kind of a new word to me. It's not really new, but it's a word I haven't used very often. Oxymoron. 
right? <laughs> Living sacrifice is an oxymoron. Living sacrifice. They oppose each other. They're different, it seems like. There's something not connected, and yet God's putting them together. And I want us to consider this. First of all, he says, here to present it. God doesn't take it. God doesn't uh, uh, force you. It's yours to give this life. That's amazing about God. Some people have such a hard time with that idea that God gives you a free will. God lets you. God will let you continue to live outside his will. He'll let you continue to live uh, in disobedience. He will allow you to do that. He'll do it. If you're a child of God, he'll do it like a father does a child. Uh, you will receive the chastisement along the way. Amen? Right. But he'll let you. That's right. My dad would let me do things in order to show me that it wasn't going to work. Did your dad ever do that? Did your mom ever do that? Yep. That you get so far where you realize this isn't working, your dad would come back and say, now you want to do it my way? Yes, dad, I do. God does that too. But here he says, this is for you to give. It's your life to give. God's given you this life. He's sacrificed for it. He's bought you with a price. And yet he asked you to give this to him, I beseech you, therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, understand this: it's a living sacrifice, isn't it? God's not calling you to a, a, a to sacrifice your life to death. What? God, that's not the purpose. God is asking you to live for Him. I know many people say, "Well, I'll die for Jesus." God's not interested in that. God wants to know if you're going to live for him. That's right. right. If you're going to be his sacrifice, you're going to live for him right. as his sacrifice. What he wants is somebody that's alive. Amen. Amen. You know, that's Amen. important for the church today. Hello. That's right. I feel like a lot of people, church goers, they appear to be alive because they look like they're breathing, <laughs> but they don't act like they're alive. Uh, yes. That's right. You don't hear from them very often. Right. You don't see them in the activity of the church. Oh, they're there, but they just as well be dead for what response the church gets from them. Amen? Amen. Amen. Come on. Hello. Amen. Boy, I wish I had about six black preachers sitting Preach. in the front row. That's right. They would, they'd be after me. They'd be, they'd be standing there. Preach it, preach it. Go on. Go on. Get them, Lord. Get them. That's right. We've got, we've got a bunch of dead people filling what God wants to be live churches. Yes, that's right. And uh, we need to be alive. We've been, we've been through nine months of pandemic forcing people to act like dead people. Don't associate. Don't get together. Don't spend time with each other. Don't do this. Don't do that. Listen, you just well live in a casket. Amen? Amen. Amen. God wants us to be alive. Yes. Right. Yeah. We need to be alive as his child, as Amen. his children. He wants us to be alive. Someone to be his feet. Someone to be his hands. Someone to be his voice. I tell you, I got, the, I got after nine months this past week, Betty Carroll moved into the facility, and she called me. She said, I'm down here in Houston. I said, I know you are, Betty, and I'm so, I'm so sorry you have to be so far away. She said, would you come and see me? And I said, can I? She said, you sure can. Well, I'm telling you what, you can ask Ruby. I, man, I was floating for two days. I said, I'll be there Friday. And Ruby and I went down Friday, got to go in, and we visited Betty. We visited Miss Angie, who was next to bed to her. We visited Miss Robin, who owns the, the hat. We visited, I'm telling you what, I felt like a preacher again. <laughs> Woo, man, the church alive. I was getting to be Jesus' feet. I was getting to be Jesus' hands. I was getting to be right. Jesus' voice. That ought to excite us as Christians to be able to Then right out of the box, Debbie McHenry calls me and says, Miss Ruth wasn't doing well. Could I come see her? And I said, boy, I'd love to visit Miss Ruth. You know, Miss Ruth, she just grins from ear to ear when she sees me. Uh, when she sees anybody, so that's when she sees me. <laughs> She's so happy right. because she gets to see me. Right, know? right. And uh, she said, would you come see I said, I sure will. And she said, okay. Yes, we want you to come. I said, okay, sure. And so we drove down to Livingston yesterday and got to visit with Miss. Yeah, so here's the neat thing that I didn't get to visit with just Miss Ruth, which was exciting. I got to visit with Debbie. I got to visit with Debbie's family. I mean, it was exciting. I left there on a cloud nine. I, 
I felt, man, I felt last two days I've had the greatest time. You know why? Because I was being the hands and feet and voice of Jesus. Right. That's my purpose as a living sacrifice. That's right. If I'm not doing that, I'm not being used the way I'm supposed to be used. That's right. Living sacrifice loves to give, loves to be a part, loves to have God use it. That's right. You know the problem with living sacrifice? Here's the biggest problem. I heard this a long time ago, and I think it's so true. Is a living sacrifice is always getting off the altar. Yes, yes. Oh, we come to a church service like this, and oh, I'm convicted. I'm going to have to really get, I'm going to get on that altar. Okay, praise God. Get on that altar. But before the service is over, you just got one leg off the side, you know, yeah. kind of hanging there. Yeah. And by the time you get to the car, you got both feet off. You're sitting up on the edge of the altar. That's right. And before you get home to the meal that you prepared for lunch, you've done got off the altar. That's right. A living sacrifice. That's right. We have to, as a living sacrifice, keep getting back on the altar. Amen. Always. Don't get discouraged because you fell off. Don't get discouraged because you jumped off. Just get back on right. that altar. Right. That brings me to the part of the sacrifice. We need to be surrendered to his will. You know, the, the definition of sacrifice, the act of giving up something valued for the sake of something else regarded as more important or worthy. That's a sacrifice. Amen. Uh, my life is Amen. valuable to me. So the one I've got, I don't know how much time I've got left. I want to make sure to use it up the best I can. But God says I'm going to be a living sacrifice. So that sacrifice means I take something that I consider valuable, which is my life, and I offer it unto something that's more important and worthy. That's right. And I do that. Right. His name? Jesus, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 That's who we sacrifice. That's, right. That's who we're to be born to. That's who's paid the price for us. This is me giving up daily that being for the sake of letting God have complete control of everything. Underline that. Everything in our lives. It's called dying to self. Dying to self. Spirit over self. God over my flesh. His will instead of my will. Seeking what God wants instead of what I want. Boy, do we ever see a need for this in the church today? People are just not interested in what God wants for them. They seem to be without concern for the church, but just looking for what pleases them. Where would church be if everyone just sought out in the churches what they wanted instead of seeking what God wanted for them? Now think about it. They'd be flopping from church to church. It might sound something like this. We like the music over at that church downtown, so we go down there for the music. And we like this other one's facility because it has better seating. But on the way, we stop by the second church that's on the corner because they have the best coffee bar and snacks before service. And then we jump back to the first church because they have a good Sunday school that the children like. And so we go there and then we jump back over to the third church because they have the best, son, best children's church for our children that they like. The preacher preaches a little too long for me and the husband or me and the wife. And so we drop back to the first church because that pastor, he always preaches short sermons. And we can finish the sermon there and get back over and pick up the kids at the third church before they get out. That's right. But listen, we're getting what we need. It may be a lot of work, but we're getting what we need. That's really great for you. Where's the sacrifice for God in all of that? You know, it bothers me that we, uh, we're, we're, we are so selfish. Yes. And the church has benefited that. We played into that because we try to provide everything, you know. Well, if you hear that we don't have something, we'll bring it to the preacher because the preacher will jump on that right away and make sure that happens, you know, because we've got to have what everybody else in town has because if we don't, we won't reach that crowd. Oh, good grief. That's right. Is God the God of the church or are we the God of the church? Amen. I know this, and I've said this a lot. We, we, we join with the church this area. You know why? And I'll tell you why. Because every church this area provides a need for a group of people. That's right. There's a group of people that go to the Methodist church right up the block here. They wouldn't come to our church. It's not that they don't love us, but they like the way they do things up there. 
And they're interested in the way they teach the Bible up there. There's another, there's two, there's let's see, one, two, three other Baptist churches, four Baptist churches in our area. That those people go to those churches, not because they hate us, but because they found something there that they need. That's what's important. And it's not just about finding needs being met. It's about finding a place to serve. Amen. That's right. I've had people come to me and say, well, I just don't find a place to serve. How hard did you look? How hard did you try? I don't remember you ever coming to me and saying, I'd like to do this, that, and the other, that I would be excited to help you get started. That's right. I find people are quitters today. They start and quit, start and quit, start and quit. And I tell people all the time, I'll take whatever you give me. If you give me five weeks, I'll take it. Because I'm the, I'm the captain of the volunteer army, so I can't complain. If five weeks is all I'm going to get, then I'll take five weeks. If I just get one week of teaching my dad's Bible school, I'll take it. But boy, it sure is nice when you stumble into somebody that's committed and stays. Amen. We have, we have a couple of teachers here in our church have been here since before I came 25 years ago. Still teaching, Amen. working, and doing things. <coughs> who benefits the church? Who benefits God's service the most? Those who come in and they're like firecrackers. They fire up for a two-weekend two, two, two situation and they're off running someplace else to have their needs felt. Or is it that person that stays, works through the problems, gives themselves to the children or to their classes or to the ministry that God said, that's who God uses. Living sacrifices. Amen. Living sacrifices. That's what God builds his work on. We've got this all backwards. We think church is here to provide a need for us. Church is here for us to provide for us. It, it, makes, it goes back to a Catholic fellow said this one time. That's not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Let's apply that to the, to the word of God and to the church. That's not what your church can give you. That's what you can give to the work of God. Yes. And then you give it. Yes. Don't quit because it gets hard or doesn't go the way you think it should. Amen. What is our rationale for this sacrifice? Well, he said it's our reasonable service. It's reasonable to expect this. For you to sacrifice should be considered reasonable. Yes. Why do you sacrifice your time to come to church? Why do you sacrifice your treasure to the Lord? Why do you become involved with others? Because it is reasonable. God did it for us. He gave himself for us. He's given us everything. He has put us in a place with a family to be a part, a part of that family. That's right. It's reasonable, isn't it? Amen. Sure it is. Amen? Amen. That's the sacrifice God asks. And then we need to not only have a living sacrifice, it needs to be a prepared sacrifice. Follow along with me. When he says that we are to prepare, we are to set ourselves up, able to understand the will of God. Now, let's go through the process. First of all, he says it should be holy. It should be holy. You see, this prepared sacrifice is not something we come uh, just taking whatever we want to and just throw it up on the altar. This has to be a thought out thing. This has to be something we give him some thought to and plan. And this sacrifice is not something we're giving. It's us. And so God says, when you come to the bring this sacrifice to me, make sure, first of all, it's holy. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14 through 16 says this, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. God wants for this sacrifice that he plans to use to be a holy sacrifice, one which is prepared for him, is to be holy. That means to be sacred, without fault or sin, to be set apart unto God. This living sacrifice must be striving towards holiness and prepared. Secondly, he says it should be acceptable. Acceptable. Not to the world's standards, but to God's standards. That's right. That's right. You know, that's the problem. Again, with the church, the church is deciding, let's make ourselves pleasing to the world. 
And they justify that and say, well, if we do that, then we'll get more people. But you see, God's the one that adds to the church daily such as to be saved. You don't do that. I don't do that. Right. It's not by what we do, the color of our building, the niceness of our, our pews. It's not those things. It's God that adds to the church Amen. daily such as to be saved. Right. Yeah. We are to be acceptable as a sacrifice to him. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 6 says this, to the praise of his glory, of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us acceptable in the beloved. Understand this, we are accepted in the fact that we are in Christ, and being in Christ, God welcomes us into his presence. Amen. It's when we try to walk outside of Christ, right. we get in trouble. And then Romans 12, 2 goes on to say, be not conformed to this world. The greatest stranglehold that Satan has on Christians is the influence of the world. That's right. You know, I love this text. I'm going to tell you why I love this text. When I was about 15 years old, there was an activity going on that I wanted to go to. My dad and mom had talked about it and decided it just wasn't something I as a Christian should be a part of. But everybody else was going. And boy, I tell you what. As a 15-year-old, I could raise the roof. And I got in their face, and I told them what I thought about it, that they wouldn't let me, blah, blah, blah. And I, just, I deserve to be, why don't you trust me, blah, 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 all this stuff. And I walked out the door, slammed the door, walked out on the front lawn out there at Kingsland, Texas, and I sat down there, and I was pouting, and I was mad, and I had my lip pushed out, and I was bowed up like an old alley cat. Excuse me, alley. I was bowed up like an <laughs> Pulled up like a little tomcat. Uh, and, I, and all of a sudden, I heard the door open. My dad walked out with a Bible in his hand. Walked out and sat down beside me. Now, I tell you what, when I saw the Bible, it began to diffuse me because I knew I wasn't going to be able to answer this. Because as a 15-year-old, I didn't have the command of the Word of God yet. Dad sat down beside me. He said, son... I want to read something to you, and I want you to understand that our desire for you is that you be a godly man. And he opened the Bible, Romans chapter 12, and read verses 1 and 2 to me. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. He said, we want you to be a transformed young person, not just like all the others. There was absolutely nothing I could say. My dad closed the Bible. If I remember right, I don't remember if he prayed with me or not. And he went back to the house. And I closed that evil spirit inside of me that demanded I get what I want because my dad was giving me what God wanted. That's right. Be not conformed to this world. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Right. Man, I wish every Christian would grab hold of that. Right. I wish we'd live by that. I wish when we get out, we walk out of church, and we're out here in the world, and the whole world is coming in on us, I wish just once we'd stop and say, wait a minute. That's not who I am. That's right. I'm not of this world. Amen. I'm here because God planted me here, but I'm not here to stay. I'm going home one day. Right. And I want to make sure that I'm ready. I want to make sure I'm, I'm a child of God. I want to be able to stand before God and hear him say, Welcome, thou good and faithful servant. Amen. Amen. I wish every Christian would get a hold of this fact. You're not here to be like the world. The things the world shoves in your face and says, You need to have this. If you don't have this, you're missing out. By, this is what makes your world. Uh, every, listen, tell the world to take a hike. That's right. Because God has something far better for us Amen. as a child of God. Yes. Amen. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, Amen. but is of this world. Right. And you know what? Satan has never changed his tactics. He just uses those three things. Right. He's been using them from Adam, and he's still using them today because he said, why change something that works? Why don't we, as God's children, decide it's not going to work on me anymore? Amen. I'm done with that low life living. That's right. Amen. Amen. I'm going to live on the mountaintops. Right. I'm going to live on the pinnacles. I'm going to live where Jesus reigns. Amen. I'm not going to live in this old scummy world. That's right. I tell you, Ruby and I, as we, we plan vacations and things, one of the things I find 
vacation spots love to throw the world at you. Oh, yes, they show me all the places you can go and drink and party and do this and do that. And, oh, you can, and they show you all those places. And the Christian, many of those places, it's just not something I want to do. That's right. It's not something that appeals to me. That's right. I have a timeshare. My timeshare has a super nice, beautiful place in New Orleans. And uh, I told Ruby, I said, why don't we go there and rent the presidential suite? You know, wouldn't that be fun? And she said, well, what are we going to do? <laughs> what are we going to do? That's right. Their advertisements were right on the French Quarter. We're right near Bourbon Street. All the places all, right there for you. I remember my, I've never been there. I remember when my daughter told me about Mardi Gras. She went there one year as a missionary during Mardi Gras. And she said, Dad, every place you went smelled like urine and beer. She said, it was sickening. Oh, that's where I want to go. You bet. Let me have some of that. Dad. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. But be transformed. That's what God calls us to, a transformed life. How does that come? Through a renewed mind. To <coughs> improve what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. Renewed mind. Renewed means revived, rekindled, revitalized, refreshed. First of all, we know that we have a reborn mind, if we're saved, from a lost, flesh-driven mind to a Christ-centered, spirit-driven mind. We've moved and been born again. But then I'll tell you what happens. Something happens to that reborn mind. Mm -hmm. You remember when you first got saved? I mean, there wasn't anything God could ask you to do you weren't ready to do. I mean, you were ready. Mm -hmm. I was nine years old when I got saved. You know, the first thing I did, I went and found my best friend and brought him to the guy who lived in the Lord and said, please tell him about Jesus. Now, do you think as an unsaved nine-year-old I'd ever thought to do that? No. And why was it important? Because it was important to me. That's right. From nine years old on, everything I've ever done, I've tried to Make it all about God. But you know what? You get tired. Or you get lethargic. Or it becomes mechanical. I sing a song. Grace. Well, I'm feeling that song. That hymn speaking to me. No, it's not. Could you pray for this? Sir? Oh, preacher, please ask somebody else. I promise you, when you first got saved, if I said, if you pray, you said, I'll do the best I can. You were. Right. That's right. And somewhere along the line, you became unenthusiastic. Right. You lost the desire for the things of God. We need a revival. That one who had that same mind has become unenthusiastic for the things of God to being one who's revived, spirit-filled, energized with the Spirit of God, engaged Enthusiastic, alive. Yes. Amen. Alive. Alive. It's alive. <laughs> That's what preachers ought to be saying about their church. It's alive. Yeah, something happened. It's alive. Amen. Amen. A bunch of zombie Christians walking around, you know, half dead all the time. That's right. Looking for, excited over the things of God. Amen. Ruby and I were talking about when we first got to church. I hate to use us as an example, but it's, a, it's the best example I have. Okay. Ruby and I, I've been saved since nine, and I've become a teenager, and during my teenage years, I've gotten away from the Lord. And Ruby and I, we got married, and uh, we were attending a little church once a week. We'd go if we felt like it. We drove by this little church, and they had a tent set up. We had to slow down. We had cop cars out on the street slowing people down because there was cars everywhere. Well, I've been down that road many times. I've never seen that before. I told Ruby, I said, why don't we go there next Sunday and see what's going on? Little old church. It wasn't as big as this church, I don't think. Little old church. Had a, it was like this church was when I first came to This church and had a little church next to it. That's all it had. It didn't have a big picture there. And we got there that next Sunday. And we walked in the back doors and people were greeting us and they were excited. They were talking to us about that time. This big old blue bus pulls up outside. And people, and people and kids are getting off this bus. And I went, what in the world is that? Well, that's our bus ministry. What's that? Well, we go out and pick up people that don't have a ride to church or children whose parents can't, won't, can't or won't bring them to church. And we bring them to church. 
Really? And then I went to the service. I heard this guy preach. And he preached. He didn't preach some boring message. I mean, he went up there and went, oh, those are the Lord's day today. We're going to have the Lord's service. We're going to do this and that. And, that. Well, I don't know, but I don't know. and when I said amen, we'll go home. Now he got up and he preached and grabbed our attention. And Ruby and I, we're, what were we, about 19 years old? Both of us 19 years old. We're married again, by the way. Uh, that's why we're having our 50s. We ain't having our 50s. <laughs> uh, we were 19 years old. We sat there. We sat in the back of the church. And we watched as people would listen. And there were amens. The invitation was given. People came and moved to the front. And things were happening. I, I looked at Ruby and I said, I don't understand what's going on. We went and got our car, drove home that afternoon. We, we'd never been to Sunday night church. But Sunday night came. I said, let's go. 5.30, we loaded up and went to church. Two little 19-year-old kids. We sat there in that church and watched. Wednesday night, I didn't even know they had Wednesday night services. <laughs> they had a Wednesday night service? Yes, I'm going to be there. Got there Wednesday night. First Thursday night we were there. They had Thursday night visitation. Remember church used to do that? They'd all meet on Thursday night and they'd go out visit. They had Thursday night visitation. I didn't know what that was. Didn't know what it did. But I knew I needed to be there Thursday night. Said, you know, from the time we walked to that church, we hardly ever missed a service. You know why? Because it was alive. Right. And we were alive. Right. And we wanted to be a part of something that was alive. That's right. Church has become so dead, nobody wants to be a part of it anymore. That's right. They go out the back door just as fast as they come in the front door. We need revival. We need that revived spirit. The church has been desynthesized in this last year to be non-engaged group of people. That's right. Many with a who cares attitude about survival of the church anymore. Well, seems like they're making it all right without us. Let's just forget about going back. Let's just stay home. Who cares if the church comes back or not? We're doing all right without it. Most folks are thinking that. That's right. I guarantee you they are. That's right. Some of you will tune in and listen this morning that hadn't been tuning in or hear that. You say, I've become like that. I've gotten to the place where I don't care anymore if I ever go back to church or not. Crazy. God's called us to be alive. Listen to the church, the first church, the church of Pentecost. Okay, listen to how it started. Acts chapter 2, verse 1, 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Amen. I'm sorry. Amen. But when the church started, it started because everybody was in one place. Right. Amen. Right. One place. Right. They were all right there. Right. In one place. And then what happened? It says, uh, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. <laughs> And it filled all the house where they were sitting. Amen. It was the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Came in to dwell the believer that day. And from that day on, every time a person gets saved, the Holy Spirit is gone. Every person gets saved, the Spirit is in you. We don't have to pray for the Holy Spirit to come. He's already here. He walked right. in when you came in. That's right. Now, he may be bridled. He may be held in stocks and bonds in your, in, in bounds in, in, or chains in your life somehow because you won't let him lose. But he's there. Amen. And he's ready to fill your life. That's right. He's ready to do in you what he did at Pentecost. If you're ready, he'll do that. That's right. If you're a living sacrifice, prepared, ready, with a renewed mind, our living sacrifice should be prepared. It should be holy. It should be acceptable. And not conform to the world, but transform on renewing of, of our minds and able to prove what is that good and perfect will of God. Amen. Amen. Do you realize how much easier it would be to determine the will of God if we were living sacrifices? Mm -hmm. We struggle with the will of God because the will of God doesn't always line up with what we think we want to do. Yes. I'm telling you the truth. Right. Well, I've been trying to discern what the will of God is. You know what? If you're walking with God, if you're a surrendered sacrifice to God, you don't have to wonder what the will of God is. That's right. It'll be plain and simple. That's right. It's just a matter of you doing it. That's why I think he ends with this. 
You see, if we're the living sacrifice, we will see God's will as good, number one. Amen. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. So we will see the will of God, even though it may be different than what we want, we'll see it as good because it comes from God. And we being surrendered to His purpose, will accept it as being good. Secondly, we will find the will of God acceptable. We'll be completely accepted to whatever God is doing in us, through us, and around us because we are a living sacrifice. That's good. A living sacrifice. Amen. I owned a horse when I was a kid. Why am I using a lot of it? It's okay. I owned a horse when I was a kid. When Daddy bought Pretty Thing, that was her name, Pretty Thing, she was a two-year-old uh, uh, little filly, and she had, uh, she had a mind to run. She was halter broke, meaning she never had a bit in her mouth. Well, that's right for a little while. But pretty soon that horse realized, you know what? With that halter, he can pull my head around. He can jerk on it, tag on it, do whatever he wants to do. But if I want to go to the barn, I'm going to the barn. And one day I was headed back to the house, and she got in her head that I was going home. And all she could think about was there going to be some oats waiting for her to see this there. And she took off running. And I mean, I, could, I was pulling back as hard as I could. I had her head pulled down where she was having to look like this. And she was just in a full of... <clears throat> And she saw these tree limbs and she took off four little tree limbs. And pretty soon I'm ducking those tree limbs like that. Finally, I grabbed that thing and I pulled her head completely around back here by me. She's still loafing as best she can. And all of a sudden, she stops. And I jump off that horse. And I wasn't very Christian about what I said to that horse. <laughs> I got back to the house. I told Daddy, we got to do something. Daddy said, I got just the thing. He went and got the bit, put it in her mouth. And from that moment on, I had control of it. Where was I going with this? The acceptable will of God. You know what? If you're the, if you're the surrendered sacrifice, if that horse was surrendered to my will, she'd have never had to have a bit in her mouth. She wouldn't have had to fight what I wanted to do. She'd have been willing to go wherever I wanted to go, when I wanted to go, and stop when I told her to stop, if she had been surrendered to me. But because she didn't, they had to put a bit in her mouth. You know what? As a surrendered sacrifice to God, you will find that acceptability to anything that God is doing. No matter how tough it is, no matter how hard it is, no matter if it's going against everything you've ever wanted in your life, you say it's okay because it's God's will that I'm after, not mine. And then thirdly, we will be satisfied that God's will is perfect. We'll not balk at what God is doing, even if we do not understand it, because we have become a, life, a living sacrifice, totally submissive to His will, and by faith, trusting His every decision for us. Because that's the will of God, isn't it? Yes. Him doing what He wants to do. And I have to be willing to accept that. And the only way I can do that is be a living sacrifice. Amen. You get it? Amen. Yeah. Got it. Isn't that, isn't that Amen. simple? But isn't it something we need to hear? That's right. As a church. Right. Be a living sacrifice. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you for this morning. I pray, Father, that as we've listened, as we've heard, as we've been challenged this morning, that God, we would leave here ready to stay on the altar, to tie ourselves to it, to make sure we don't get off. That we be that living sacrifice, not fighting you, not unwilling, but Lord, willingly sacrifice to you in whatever you choose for our lives, whether we understand it or not, whether it's going where we think we ought to go or not. It's doing what you want that should matter most. We love you and thank you, God, for that. Now, Lord, if there's someone that does not know you as their Lord and Savior this morning, we've not preached about salvation, but God, we know that it's only because of Jesus Christ that we find the acceptance in you. And, Lord, there may be some that have never come to that place of receiving you as their Lord and Savior. Their altar is an altar, Father, that you provided through Jesus Christ. And you invite them to this altar where you will give them eternal life. Lord, I pray today that they might come to receive you as their Lord and Savior. If you're listening or 
you hear me and you understand that you are not saved and you need to be saved, I challenge you right now in your heart, would you just cry out to the Lord and say, Dear Lord, I'm lost. I'm a sinner. I will die and go to hell unless somebody doesn't do something for me. Dear Lord Jesus, I know you did it. You died for me. And you went to the grave and you rose the third day and now you offer this eternal life a relationship with you. And Lord, this morning, I invite you into my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sins, to cleanse me, to give me that eternal life. Allow me, Father, today to walk in that relationship with you that I've never experienced before. If you prayed that prayer or a prayer similar to it, and you think you've received Christ as your Savior, you'd like an affirmation, I wish you'd call me. Give me a call or come by and see me or see me this morning before you leave. Let me know that you made that decision today. I will rejoice with you and I will encourage you in what steps to do next. We're just so glad if you receive Christ today. Your child of God, let's walk as living sacrifices. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, don't forget tonight at 6 30, we're having our services. Don't forget also Thursday night, our fish fry starts at 6 30 in the fellowship hall. And uh, we'll have a great time. Why don't we stand? And uh, in way of being a, uh, a sacrifice for others, if you will, take and spray a little disinfectant around where you're sitting, just in case. We've been so fortunate. God has been so good to us to protect us from this virus. Let's continue in that walk of protection, all right? Amen. And we do that by spraying a little sacrifice on the altar, okay? Amen. All right. You're dismissed. I'll give you